started by anxiety. And I start writing down as a sort of um, introduction that we do have problems with anxiety. And in many ways, we allow anxiety to take place and domain and control. Anxiety will always lead us to suffer by anticipation. And yet we know that we should trust the Lord more and more. But if we do have issues with anxiety, it means that our trust is lower. And today we will, we will, we will try through the Word of God to understand how can I fight anxiety. People fight anxiety with pills. They go to a psychiatrist, they go to a psychologist, they go to, uh, to the doctors to try to find out to fight anxiety. And what they do is that they medicate you. They give you medication. First, the psychologist, they analyze your mind, they analyze your brain, they will tell you what is happening with you, and, and then the psychiatrist will prescribe to you what do you need to take in order for your levels of anxiety to come down. But they won't come down because they make it, the medication, what it does is that it will, it will numb all those levels of anxiety, but they are still there. It can, it, it can treat them. Jesus yet he has the recipe. He says for us to don't be anxious for anything, but yet to seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then all things will be added to us. Uh, sometimes it becomes difficult, especially when difficulties are ahead of us. It's difficult what? It's difficult not to suffer by anxiety, especially because difficulties come and they are ahead of us. A few days ago I was praying and I was speaking with the Lord and I was basically tell, telling God that the path. It, it looks like that we, when you are facing a problem and then you bring the solution and the solution is there, it looks like that suddenly something else comes up. But that, that, those are not good news for me, are old news. Because I know that with the Lord is like that. Even concerning ourselves uh, individually. There is stuff within you that the Lord wants to deal with. And after he deals with this stuff, he wants to deal with another stuff. Today I was speaking with a person in the morning. I was ministering to a person in the morning. Sometimes we start earlier. Even on Sundays, in the meantime that we prepare the sermon, we need to minister to the people. And I was telling the person that, you know what, this is, a, this is something that God has been brought to your attention. But the person, what it does, it ignores the bells of the Lord. Today we also will see, today we will see also, that sometimes the voice of the Lord is it's somewhere in some place that we don't understand. But the, the voice of the Lord is there. But sometimes we ignore the bells, we ignore the voice when God says, I want to, take, I want to deal with this. In your life, because this is, I've been as a stone in your way, and you stumble continually on the stone, and you can't get rid of it. And the stone is there. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and I will repeat again. Do not be anxious about anything. Calm. It's like a statement that the Apostle Paul wants to make, a full statement. Do not be anxious about anything. He could put a, a dot there, but he decided not put because he wanted to continue with the sentence. So he decided to put a comb there to, just to clarify us that this is a full statement and that is important for him to state that we, do not, we, we should not be anxious about anything. After the comb, he says, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, he's telling you something that is not forbidding you, is not putting, setting as a commandment or a rule, but he's telling you like you, you cannot be anxious for anything. But then he says, but in everything, in other words, he's giving you the secret formula. He says, but in everything, by prayer, first and foremost, by your prayers, by your prayers, and supplication with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is not just, you know, sometimes people can thank a lot of things, but then if your, life, if your life is not a thankful life, your words are empty. You can say thank you, Jesus, for all the things you want. Here in the church, in the devotionals in the morning, 
in your time with God, you can say thank you. But if your, if your mouth is a complaint mouth, a mouth that is full of gossip and complaint, then you are not really thankful. Because then thankfulness starts in your heart. The acknowledgement that God is good. When I have my processes of my miserability, is what God calls what always to my attention. Or maybe it's my inner me that calls to the attention that in the end of the day I must be thankful because I'm not worthy of anything that I live, anything that I possess, nothing that I have. And, and every member of my family, my friendship, my friends and so on, I don't deserve this. Yet you are merciful and you are good with me. In moments that I don't know about you, that I have many times, that I feel so miserable, so low, so down, so, so not worthy of His grace and mercy. And maybe that's the point where God wants the Christian to be. The point where we don't really feel special, we don't really feel good, we feel sinners, we feel in failure, we, see, we feel that we are always two steps behind God and we need His mercy and compassion. But in the meantime that you feel like that, the Spirit of God, it shows you that or can make you understand that everything that you have, it's actually fruit of His love and mercy and kindness. But we need to be aware of what God is doing in our lives. And we need to enjoy every single moment. This is what you have for me now, I will enjoy it. This is the process now, I will enjoy it. And, and peacefully and grade by grade, you will overcome every single step of your life. Thanksgiving, would you made your, let your request be made known by God? Sometimes we hide ourselves even before God. Sometimes we want everybody to, to, to feel our frustrations. We want everybody to know how miserable we are. And we want everybody cons to, con to be concerned with us. We need, a, a, in other words, we want a level of attention that can be, that we can receive by God Himself. And we can, we can make this to, uh, to the fellow community, but we are not capable to, to make this known to God. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. Let your requests be made but known by God. He is saying, apart. first and foremost, it's not your neighbor, it's not your wife, it's not your husband, it's not your friend, but it's God that needs to know your requests, your concerns, your worries, the things that bother you. He must be the first and foremost to know everything that is in your heart. But we're not going to be in Philippians. We could. I love this, this, this letter or this book. But we're not going to be here. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19. And then after you open the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 19, you can stay there. I will jump to my first point, which is my challenges, the size of a mountain. Of course. According with my idiosyncrasy or according with my understanding, my challenges, they can be the size of a mountain. Yet my challenges, maybe, maybe for me, your challenges now are nothing. And I can say, yeah, you know what? That's nothing. Ah, what is that? But for you, it's a mountain. But I might have somebody besides me that can tell me, you know, João, your problems are nothing. I'm telling you why. Because that person is really living deeper problems than myself. So sometimes when we think that we are living a problem, there is always somebody living a bigger and higher problem. My challenges, the size of a mountain, is my point one, based on 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 3. That says, the Bible reads as follows, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Who knows what Elijah had done? Everybody knows more or less, ne? Elijah killed him. Lots of prophets with a sword. He killed them. He was brave enough to kill them all by himself. By the power of the Spirit of God, of course. But he was used by God to do so. Uh, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods to, to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by this tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant, his servant there. My challenge is the size of a mountain. A man that days, be, days, days before killed all the prophets with a sword, brave enough to do su such, a, such a difficult task. It's the same man that suddenly 
the Jezebel with the spirit that was in her. That many in the church already heard about the spirit of Jezebel. And we think that is a spirit that, that, that many preachers, they say that is, it's a spirit that manifests in the woman for this and that. But mainly what the spirit of Jezebel does is that it input, it is a spirit that inputs fear and paralyzes. So now suddenly you find the prophet paralyzed by fear because of one woman. But he defeated how many men behind him? That he left. He was brave. Of course, we know that he faced a spiritual war when he, when he, when he killed that, those prophets with a sword. Of course, that was more than physical, was also spiritual. And this is what many Christians don't understand, that our struggle, either inner, either out of us, it's always a spiritual struggle. It's always a spiritual welfare. That's why the same apostle that wrote Philippians in Ephesians, he say, your welfare is not against blood and flesh, yet against principalities, powers of this world. This is in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. In other words, he's saying that it's not about what you see, but it's about what you can't see. And what we can't see is actually what we ignore, just because we can't see. Thomas, when Jesus appeared to all the disciples, Thomas, he could not uh, uh, acknowledge that was Jesus because he wanted to see. Because he didn't understand that the, depth of, the death of Jesus Christ and resurrection, more than physical, was spiritual. Only a powerful spiritual being like Jesus, which is God, God made man, God himself, only him could spiritually and physically die and rise, rise again. And come back because even if, if we die physically we will not have power to come back but Jesus the Bible says that he went to the shell he went to, to, the, to hell and got back and he rose again from that so the challenges of, of Elijah they weren't just physical but they were spiritual now he will need a push of God he will need a push of God and I'm considering to do out of this sermon of uh, led by anxiety, maybe a series of one, two, three, but this is just, I don't put one because I'm just considering. Uh, but he didn't understand, and he, need, he, he will need a boost from God for him to understand that your welfare is also spiritual. That's why I'm going to be compassionate towards you, because there is a spiritual welfare around you that allows you to be, in, in other words, like him, now he's with a challenge that for him is the size of a mountain. He can't see a, ahead of the mountain. My point two is my un unknown journeys. And I wrote my unknown journeys because sometimes we walk without direction. Oh, but I'm coming to church every weekend. This is something that you could say ahead of the sermon. So I'm, I'm just be anticipated. After what I'm going to say, you could say, oh, but I'm coming to church every Sunday. I go to the, to the Wednesday service. I worship with everything I got. I love God with everything I got. I, I pray in the morning. I pray in the night. I give thanks for the food He gives me and everything that He does in my life. So I think I'm not walking in the darkness. But sometimes you can be doing all this and you are walking by unknown ways. Why? Because our life is not just physical, yet it is also spiritual. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, a spiritual awakening starts in us. Until then, we are like a rose, you know the rose, né? that you cut off the rosary and you put in a glass of water. That rose will bloom, of course will bloom. But will bloom to die. If it's a button of rose when it's closed, you cut and you put in the water, it will bloom nicely, beautifully, but then will die. It won't last in the water because his, 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 his source is not the water directly, yet it needs water, but it's the rosary where it, the, the, the rose was, was connected to the branch. So many of us, we are like that. And we need Jesus to take us out of that glass of water and place us back in the rosary, in the branch. And then we won't be just spirit, physically alive, but we will be spiritually alive. Because then even if the petals of rose will fall down, 
another rose will come up after that. Because why? Because we didn't pass away physically, and so we won't pass away spiritually. But sometimes we are blooming and we are blooming, flourishing, but for one day to die. Because we are not spiritually awakened. But when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, deeply in your heart, what you are saying is that I'm requesting for a, born, a, for a newborn and to be a born again and to become a new creature for something to happen in my life. And then it happens. So all of us, we go through unknown ways. Or I wrote point two, my unknown journeys. Places that our mind, our spirit goes, even if you are apparently in the right place, in time. First Kings chapter 19, verse 4 to 8 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. In other words, he ran away, he flew away. He wanted to be forgotten. Sometimes it's not that the people forget about us, but we are the ones that make ourselves to be forgotten. I always say it's not about sometimes, and when you speak about for, to be forgotten, you speak about inclusion. Sometimes it's not that people don't want to include you, it's that you, you exclude you from, from the community, for example. It's not that people exclude you. No, there is people that they always think that, oh, people exclude me, people reject me. But sometimes uh, people don't think, I, I, I struggle with that in my journey with God, in my beginning, in my Christianity, I struggled with that. I was the person that will struggle with that the most. I always thought, and my wife is there and she knows, I always thought that nobody likes me, everybody excluded me, everybody stopped talking because they were spoke, speaking about me and so on. So when I started, when, and when God then started showing me that the problem wasn't the people, the problem was you, the problem is you. Nobody excludes you. Who tells you that nobody likes you? Did somebody ever told you that they don't like, straightforward, I don't like you? It's not about, and, and then even the Lord ministered to me, and people won't like you. You can't escape from people not liking you, and that's why it's nonsense when we try to please everybody. Because if somebody doesn't like me, it won't like me, no matter what I do. So then we have a, the biggest example in the Bible, which is Jesus. Not all the people like Jesus. When he died in the cross of the Calvary, how many people stood there with him? None. Two or three. So where was the, all those people that he benefited? That he, he, he performed those miracles, miracles, those beautiful things. Where were they? So that's why the life of Jesus wasn't a life of trying to please other people and trying to get their acceptance. So you need to accept me. I'm dress, I dress this way in order for you to accept me. I talk this way in order for me to accept me. I like this type of movies and so on in order for me to accept me. If I don't like, I don't like. I was ministry to one of my kids these days, Joshua. I was telling him he likes that song. What is that song? Not Macarena. That song that you... Huh? Despacito, yeah, you like that song, Despacito, and he was pushing me to hear Despacito by the house, by the car, until that I have to set the boy and say, sorry, Joshua, I don't like Despacito, <laughs> finish, and if I show you a song, uh, maybe you don't like my song, so it's not because of you, it's because I don't like Despacito, so don't play Despacito, forcing me, that look, Despacito, I don't want to hear Despacito, and then I minister to him, it's not, and it doesn't have nothing to do with you individually, Joshua. It's the music. I don't like the music, but praise the Lord that you like the music. But there is music that I will show you when you will say, you know, Daddy, I don't like this music. If, for example, and I'm pretty sure that he understood. So he never came back with his pasito again. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> the song is just annoying for, for Joshua. For Joshua, annoys hearing Tino saying, easy. And for me, it doesn't annoy him. So, you see. I have to come up with that example for, for Joshua. <laughs> for me, easy. It doesn't bother me at all. But for Joshua, it irritates him to the limit. And in other words, what, what it bothers you might not bother me. And what it bothers me not, might not bother you. Because we are different. Yet this man, he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and asked that, the might, that he might die, saying, it is, 
Enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So this is the, pro the process that after fear to control over him, this is the process that he starts entering in anxiety, but before his anxiety is this miserability thing that he had. Now he wants to call the attention of God, because eventually you want to hear from God what you won't hear, you will see then that you won't hear, but what you want to hear from God is, Oh, you are so special, you are the best in the world, I will empower you, oh, I anointed you to, for, to do this and to do that. And now many of us, we are expecting from God to tell us such things like this. But we will hear something that he will tell this man that is more precious than all the words he could say to him. And he will show Elijah that more than telling him that you are so special, he will tell him that you are useful to me. And that should be enough for you. You are useful. I won't quit on you that easily. So, I'm no better than my father's. Verse 5, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. The broom tree will leave, will leave some liquid and some flavor and smell that if you stand there for long, you will die. <clears throat> but he didn't. Because he, beyond the tree was over the protection of God. And then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was, uh, there was at his head a cake baked with stones and a jar of, of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. But he went to the Mount of God, to Horeb, but in the end of the day, he was running away from the purpose of God. But God, as you see, God did not stop blessing him and taking care of him. And in the meantime, that we quit in ourselves, God always showed that he didn't quit on us. How can we see this biblically? Because even though that he was trying to take his life, that he's running away from the purpose, that he's quitting on himself, God placed the angel there to shake him up and to say, there is a jar of water and a cake. Just eat. You need strength because you're going to walk too much, my brother. He didn't knew that he needed to walk to Horeb and then go, go back all the way back. God is funny also. God is, uh, sometimes he can play jokes on you. So God could just stop him there, but no, send the angel, allow him to go to Horeb, to that then, you know what, now we need to go back all the way. Sorry, but you need to do that. But here we can see the mercy of God in what? In that he didn't stop blessing this man. Yet this man was already with, with his turn back to God. Because now I deserve to die. I no longer deserve nothing. I'm in under the yoke of fear and not under the yoke of God. Point three is God's voice where to find. It's a question, the point three. God's voice where to find. So in verse, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, thank you, Tino. Verse 9, 214 says, There he came to a cave and logged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? <clears throat> How many times God asks us, What are you doing? Or what are you doing here? How many times God already asked you, what are you doing here? Maybe some of us that we were lost in our transgressions and stories, especially those that we can in the, in the ways of recovery and we were outside. How many times God will ask, what are you doing here? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the gods of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altars and kill your prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left and they seek my life to take it away. What does he want again? He wants the attention to him. He wants to buy God, his mercy, his love and compassion, his attention with the things he did. That's why I start with I. I and I. I have been very jealous for the house of the Lord. I have been doing this. I've been so good with the house of the Lord. The God of hosts. I've been so good 
for the people of Israel. And they have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they, say, and they seek to my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand out on the mount before the Lord. Because and, and I'm pretty sure that here he was waiting to hear God, maybe with that, those words of anointing and you are so special, fear not because I am with you. And doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't say that to people because we find many people hearing this from straight from God, Joshua, for example. But the expectations of Joshua to hear that, they weren't expectations of hearing it. And he was expecting that. And God always switch out our expectations. You want to hear, I'm not going to make you hear what you want, but what you need to hear. So God tells him, you know what? Go and stand outside, please. Come out of the cave. That was the first job of God, was to take him out of the cave. The way out of the cave, just by standing there in the mountain, that was already him coming out of the problem. Because his intention was again, refuge you. From a, from a broom tree, he comes to inside of a cave. And you know the meaning of the cave. Now, now you are in the cave. You were, I don't want to see nobody. Nobody. I don't want people to see me. I just want to be here by myself. And we think that we are so brave when we do things like this. Because at the end of the day, it's our way of seeking attention of people. Of people to go to your cave and pour you. How are you? Do you need something? Shame. Can I pray with you? Oh, I should pray with you. Oh, look, the brother. He needs prayer. He needs attention deeply. Let's all pray for the brother. And the one that uh, attends the prayer, he didn't went to the cave with him. He stands out of the cave and he says, you know what? Come and stand outside. Come on. Go. Go. And he says, go and stand in the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. The Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord, the Bible says, was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, imagine, suddenly after that wind that even struck the stones, an earthquake arose in the mountain, so suddenly Elijah sees the earth shaking all over. Uh, earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a lo low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood and at the entrance of the cave and behold there came a voice to him and said what are you doing here Elijah again I'm not gonna tell you that oh I'm so sorry about you and this menace this that uh, Jezebel is threatening you oh I'm so sorry for you I'm gonna you know what Elijah I will avenge you is he just say what are you doing here Elijah can you wake up please he said again, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. And I even, I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Again, why repeat himself by the second time? When we read the Bible, there is questions that we, meet, we need to do to the Holy Spirit. To God himself. We need to ask some questions. Why? For instance, why repeat himself the same sentence to God? The same way you and I repeat ourselves to people or repeat ourselves to God. Is when we want what we want and period. And because he didn't got what he want in first place, in the first time that he spoke with God, he, he found uh, uh, the need of repeating himself again to see if this time I can get it what, what I want from God. So I wrote as my point four. His plan is not fulfilled. Point four, his plan is not fulfilled. First Kings chapter 19, verse 15 to 18. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Azael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Melohab, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Israel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave seven 
thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, he, if, you, if you read as I read the Bible, it looks like, you know, if I was Elijah, and I think that Elijah went all the way thinking about that, frustrated, because then he even found Elisha, and he didn't care about Elisha, because he was so in his thoughts, because I think he was like, yeah, but God didn't really hurt me. I told him that I am jealous for the house of Israel and the way they thrown down the altars and the way they don't care about him. And he didn't pay attention to anything. I he just said, okay, okay, it's that person that you complain to expect that level of attention. The person, ah, uh, okay. So, okay, look, uh, organize a church for me here, okay? And clean everything nicely and do. You'll do like... If it was you speaking with me, ne, the pastor, you would say... Hi, Pastor, look, I'm feeling like this, I'm feeling so bad, oh, my heart today, my soul, my spirit, I need prayer, I need that. Okay, look, prepare all the chairs here, clean, clean the drums also, and organize this wiring for me, okay? Have a good day. You would say, did he hear, did he hear every single word I just said? So this is what I have to conclude with Elisha, because God never answered him, nothing that he was expecting. God just said, you know what, you just have a task to do, a plan. To be fulfilled. So stop with your nonsense. Stop and just do it. Sometimes with God, it's about doing it. Not because we will buy, but it's about doing what He tells us to do and accept. So what He was pushing Elijah to do out again to do, it's to accept the task He proposed. The plan is not yours. Many we want to manipulate the plan of God. Elijah, deeply running away, he wanted to manipulate the plan of God. I'm not assigned for this. I have jealousy for your house. I have been seeing the prophets throwing down and the people of Israel throwing down your altars and doing all sorts of things. They don't care about you or I. So I don't know why I found uh, now realization of being here. Now, I, you know what? I must go by the wilderness to find another place to stay, another place to go. And in the meantime, God, you need to deal with my frustrations. I need a level of attention from you. I'm sorry, but I need because I've been, I've been being this guy all along, such a nice guy. When God doesn't really matter for God, then in many ways, I'm telling you, if you will be offended, I don't really mind. But I need to say this to you, church. Sometimes God is not really, he doesn't really care the way you feel or I feel. He just say, you know what? You just have to do what you have to do. Don't run your life by your emotions. In other words, this is what... God was trying to tell to Elijah without really saying it. Don't try. You have a lot to do. Come on, for real. You, I am counting on you. And you are here crying. Oh, look at me. Uh, I can't do it. Oh, the people of Israel ignore you. So he says, you just go. There is a lot to do. Oh, there is thousands of, 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 of prophets that they still not bow down to the feet of God. So you still have a task to be fulfilled. Just go and fulfill. Conclusion. God never quit on us. We are the ones that turn our back into Him. He never quit. Never. This is a statement. Of course, by several reasons, many times because we think that, and I wrote this in capital letters and bold, we think that He already quit. Many times we think, we come across with days, hours, minutes, seconds, months, that we think that God already quit on me. Or it's just me. No. How many? No. Can I see hands that you think, you know what, I messed up big time. God, he, will, God, he, will, he will never forgive me this one. I don't stop. He can't forgive me. Again, he won't forgive me. And that does not correspond to the truth because he won't quit or otherwise, what's the sense of the cross? This is what we should have in mind when we think that God quit on us. Is the sense of the cross. So Jesus went to die. In the cross of the Calvary, the painest death of all, or the painful, painest, no, that doesn't exist. The painful death of all, in the cross, but crushed bones, shared his blood in the cross, and to the point that when the Roman soldier uh, stuck a, a, a spear in, in, into his uh, bones here, the, the ribs, instead of blood, even came water, came water, spilled, spilled water on his face, not even blood. It means that maybe there was no blood no more in his body. It was just water. For what? 
For then God says, you know why? I quit on this. I, qu I quit on Jabulu. Enough. No. Jabulu, ah, big time. No. Enough. Oh, Linda. Enough. Fool. Linda again. No. So then, even Jesus will tell the Father, so why did I went to the cross? For what? So he didn't quit on you or me. And this, does it mean something, the cross? That is what the devil wants us to think. And in both letters I wrote again, that he no longer loves, accept and forgive. This is what the devil tells us. He no longer loves you. He no longer accepts you. And he won't forgive you. And how many of us, we can hear the voice of the devil many times this way. He doesn't love you no more. He doesn't accept you. And he won't forgive you this one. I'm sorry, he won't. And he whisper with your own voice. You will think that is you, that you will think that is you that, are think, that is thinking that, but many times it's not you. It's your voice that the devil is playing in your mind saying, he won't forgive you no more. He won't forgive me no more. He won't love me and no won't accept me because I'm failing big time on this matter. He can't love a person like me. That is the right position in time before God, but not when the devil is speaking in behalf of yourself. The correct, and I say it is the, is a is the right position in time before God, when you are praying with God, God gives you the conviction of sin, and you feel that weight of miserability and condemnation. Then you are in the right position with God. And because of that sense of miserability and condemnation, is when you come down on your knees and you say, you know, Father, I sin, and I must have big time, and I know it's going to be very difficult according with my understanding, for you to find love again for me and so on. But he will have that love provided for you. He showed me the cross of the Calvary. So there is nothing we can do to, to receive that love again. But this is what he does. And this is not the truth. He does love, I wrote. He does accept and he does forgive. He gave a boost to Elijah, even though that he was moving astray of the plan of God controlled by his fear. In the decisions and anxiety, he did not left or forsake Elijah. He never left Elijah or forsake Elijah. Never. Um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you he will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and be courageous. This is encouragement that God gives to us. Be strong and be courageous. And then dot. And because he wants to start another sentence. Do not fear or be in dream of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Dot again because he wants to start another sentence. He will not leave or forsake you. Saying that I want you to have this in the back of your mind. He will not leave you or forsake you. Now, of course, there is members of congregations, believers, Christians, churchgoers, whatever, that pick up this sentence, because it's a bold sentence, right after a dot comes a sentence and then another dot, a bold sentence. Many, many we take this, for example, in the rehab that we are, and we say, you know what, I can go wherever I want now, because God will never leave me or forsake me. But one thing he won't do, he won't, he won't, uh, he won't make you, he, he won't stop your decisions and he won't stop the consequences of your decisions. We stop when we put, when we go before him and apologize. When we go before him and ask for forgiveness. When we go before him and we say, give me another chance. I know that I messed up. I need your chance. I need your, your mercy again. I need you to back me up, please, because I know that I cannot do it by myself. I know I'm a failure, but I know for a fact that without you, I can't do it. This it changes the heart of God in the mind. But for us to, and I'm speaking about rehab because many people, they leave the rehab like that. Oh, because I, had, I read the Bible already and the Lord said that he will never leave me or forsake me. So it means that I can just go, he will be with me. But he will be with you, but he won't agree with your decisions and your domestic ups. If you start a shooting with somebody, you with a gun, and the person, I, the Lord will never leave you or forsake me. He won't, he won't avoid the bullet to hit you. If it has to hit you, it will hit, it will hit you. And maybe you can avoid the bullet to hit you, but if it hits you, it hits you. 
Because he was with you, but he wasn't in the business you were involved with. <laughs> this is the honest reality and not all the things that the devil is busy telling us. Things that then he will lead us to sin. John 8, 44 says, You are of your father, the devil. <laughs>